Good afternoon to you. Well, as of the time of this recording, we are mere days away from this planet's largest annual board game convention, the Eschen Spiel, where darn near a thousand board, card, and tabletop games in a variety of languages are going to become available for demo and purchase. Now, do I have the endurance to list my top 100 picks? <laughs> We're going to find out. Over the course of the next few weeks leading up to the Eschen Spiel, I am going to release several installments of this list of the games that have caught my eye, interest me the most, and explain why. Now, for this list, I'm going to focus on games that I haven't covered in other recent convention overview videos, and I'm also going to focus on games with a 2019 or 2020 release date. I'm also going to be focusing on games that are available in English, because, well, if you've watched this channel for any period of time, you know that I have a difficult enough time with my own native tongue, let alone trying to learn and teach games in foreign languages. So, even with all of those restrictions, this still leaves a substantial list to go through. A list that I present to you in absolutely no specific order whatsoever. I'm going to be as surprised as you to find out which games I'm including in this first installment. <laughs> installment which starts with number one. <sighs> okay, number one on our list is Echoes First Continent, a modular tile placement game by AEG. Now, here's a question for you, smart guy. What if the formation of Earth had gone a wee bit differently? Well, in Echoes First Continent, players are forces of nature who are molding the planet, but with competing visions of its grandeur. So you, as a player, will have the chance to create part of the world similar, but different to the one that we know. So you'll have to choose which landscapes, habitats, and species will thrive for you and which ones you want to use. Now, gameplay in Echoes is simultaneous. Each round, one player reveals element tokens from the element bag, giving all players the opportunity to complete a card from their tableau and shape the continent for their own purposes. Now, elements that can't be used can still be converted into energy cubes or additional cards in hand, or they can be added to the player's tableau to give them a greater set of options as the game continues to evolve. Mountain ranges, jungles, rivers, seas, islands, and savanna, each with their own fauna, all lie within the scope of the player's options. So, given your druthers, how would you redesign this muddy sphere that we all dwell upon? Well, the game Echoes may finally give you a chance to put your ideas into motion, in a tabletop aspect at least. And number two is Ragusa, an economic commodity speculation game set in the Renaissance by Capstone Games. Ragusa charges players with the task of building the city in the 15th century, constructing its great towers, boosting trade with the East, and finding their fortunes. How do they do this? Players will build houses on the spaces between three hexes, uh, gaining access to resources on rural spaces and actions in the city spaces, which means that a house effectively functions as a worker that's being placed, but triggering three spots at a time. Uh, players use resources gained in the countryside to build buildings, uh, conduct trade, and craft valuable commodities, the value of which varies as ships come and go from the harbor. In the city, players will gain access to actions with each spot representing the three actions that surround it. Now, this simple little worker placement aspect of it gives way to a deep engine building mechanism as not only will buildings around the production spaces utilize the houses that you've already built in the countryside, oh, but also building near other players' houses will reactivate them. Reactivate them even. Boom! Stuff's happening. There goes the houses. Giving all the players valuable opportunities outside of their turns. The game continues until it ends, and it ends once players have placed all of their houses. And then, the player with the most points for all their sources wins the game! Now, if it's one thing that Capstone Games does really well, it's make a big, meaty, beefy game. And then Ragusa appears to be one of those, which is one of the reasons why it catches my eye. Because when a company does something that they do really well, I want to know what they've done. And I can't say it better than that. Number three is probably called Aqua Mirabilis, an action point allowance area control game set in the Age of Reason by Gotha Games. In Aqua Mirabilis, <laughs> no, in Aqua Mirabil Mirabilis, oh my word. Here's how it's spelled, okay, good. Aqua Mirabilis. You, in this game, take on the role of a perfumer whose goal is to produce novel and exquisite perfumes to please the king and his court. And it all starts 
or most perfumes do, with flowers. Orange, bergamot, jasmine, lavender, narcissus, and, of course, the rose. Now, through a variety of production methods, you transform these flowers into the corresponding scents and use them to complete a perfume recipe. Not only will perfumers have to master the art of processing flowers and mixing fragrant essential oils, fixatives, and solvents, but they also have to continuously develop their knowledge and learn new techniques by studying and traveling around the game. Now, and in the game, this is represented by acquiring apprenticeships and city tiles that provide unique benefits to the owners who own them. Additionally, uh, players also have to nurture their social position among the nobles to try and influence the king and his court. Sounds like it could be simple, except that it's not, because it's going to be easy for players to get lost in the froth and the folly of the nobility and the perfumery of the court of Versailles, where all of this is taking place. Now, when perfumes are presented to the king and the court, they'll score prestige points based on how fashionable and original they are. And in the end, the player who has gained the most prestige points, haha, <laughs> wins the day. Number four is Cat Cafe, a dice rolling press your luck game that uses paper and pencil by Alley Cat Games. In this game, players are charged to make their corner in the cat cafe the best one it could possibly be. Players will entice cats over to their area by literally drawing toys for the cats to play with. Then, they'll place the toys in the most favorable ways possible, allowing them to attract the most cats and accumulate points. A cat cafe is a re-implementation and slightly altered version of the Korean game Cat Tower by Mandu Games. Cat Cafe is a light, roll-and-write game in which players draft one die per round and have access to other unused dice as the game progresses. Both of these dice are then used to draw a particular type of cat toy and place it on that level of a particular tower. Placing a toy in a particular position is important because it gives players points in very specific ways. Place a bowl next to a different and unique set of other toys, or place a cushion high up so a cat can sleep while watching from way up high and judging all of us, or give the cats yarn to play with, which they love. Each of these different approaches will provide the player with a different opportunity of how to score their cat and cat accessories. Number five is Inquisitor a cooperative murder mystery game based on a novel with a historical religious setting by Red Imp Games. Inquisitor is a game of detection based on the series of best-selling short stories by Chakek Bakira that take you to the grim fictional world of the Inquisitors. Joy. In the 15th century, the flame and the cross have become the symbols of the Holy Office, the institution whose sole purpose is to spread and defend the one and true faith. But, <laughs> as people are bound to do, these symbols also contradict each other. For one represents Persian mages of fire, and the other righteous Christians who fight with them. So, whoops. Unsurprisingly, this leads to a petty world where fear paralyzes the hearts of all those who would shy away from the ruthless eradication of any signs of evil or corruption. This world is not even full of secrets, but surrounded by them, inside and out, just saturated what with the secrets. And players cannot get away from any of them. And whenever an answer to a question is found, ten more questions appear immediately. But as for me, the only question that I'm currently left with is, if I was to consider purchasing a product, what fine product would that be? I'm Chaz Marler with a special message from Pair of Dice Paradise with captions generously provided by Visual Captions LLC using their patented Honest Caption technology. As you know, Pair of Dice Paradise creates informative and entertaining videos discussing tabletop, board, and card games. And what you might not know is that the channel's seventh year has just begun. And that's why I need your help. In order for Pair of Dice Paradise to continue providing its coverage of current and upcoming games, gaming experiences, and insights into our industry, the fundraiser for this seventh year has been launched, which you can find at the link below. Your support of this year's fundraiser goes a long way towards helping create the content that this channel produces. Plus, you can earn some pretty nifty rewards along the way. So, thank you for considering a pledge of financial support. Every little bit received helps, and I greatly appreciate it. So, thanks, and take care. Hey, and welcome back. 
Number six is La Stanza, a game of set collection powered by strategic area movement by Quind Games. Quined? Quined? Oh my word. La Stanza is a fast-paced board game in which players take the role of patrons of the arts, sponsoring the most brilliant creators of the time and commissioning the best works of art, all while creating more wealth and increasing their social status and prestige. <laughs> you didn't think they were just supporting the arts just to be altruistic, did you? <laughs> no, come on. There's prestige to be earned here. On their turn, players will move their patron through different rooms to recruit the characters that better serve their interests along the way. These characters will increase the strength of the different actions that the players may perform in the room that they end on. Commission the best artists, invest in new discoveries and trading routes, promote culture, build universities, gain the trust of kings, and create the new wonders of the Renaissance, again, while assisting your own personal prestige. La Stanza is played in continuous rounds with the goal of creating dynamic turns and a challenging gameplay in which players will enlighten the world while becoming the most prestigious patron during the Renaissance. Number seven is Kingdom's Candy Monsters, a take that, press your luck party game by Zamilio Entertainment. Here is what I know about this game. In Kingdom's Candy Monsters, you are a villain eager to accumulate candies. To accomplish this, you will use monsters as servants to help you in your mission. But if you don't feed your monsters, they'll eat all your candy and run away. So you'll use sugar cubes to cast spells and activate monster abilities. Because, of course you will. Control monsters and steal candy. That's what this game is all about. Okay? Number eight is Robin Von Loxley, a modular grid-based racing game set in the infamous times of Robin Hood by Wormgold. Troubled times these be. England has been blighted since the good and just King Richard the Lionheart was captured during the Crusades. And meanwhile, you got Robin of Loxley out there too, stealing up all the money from the rich Norman lords and using it to go free the king. Everybody just calm down. In Robin Von Loxley, you aim to collect loot tiles with your Robin and then sell loot collections all of the same color. Every field you encounter will give you a task which you can use to gather more and more fame. So you can either fulfill that task or actually you can just spend a gold to pass it by. But why would you rather keep going than earn fame? Because whoever first circles the racing track twice actually wins the game. So you have some interesting choices there balancing the fame, versus balancing the gold, versus balancing your placement on the track. And I hope that all of those things accumulate into a game in which players have to make a lot of tactical decisions to decide how exactly they want to cross that finish line and win. Number nine is Aquatica, a deck building game with variable player powers and a nautical theme by Cosmodrome Games. Aquatica is a deep, no pun intended, but easy to learn family engine builder about underwater kingdoms. In this game, you will become one of the mighty ocean kings or queens struggling to bring glory to his or her realm. And to win the game, you will need to capture and buy locations, recruit new characters, and complete goals, because each of these actions gives you victory points at the end of the game. You'll do so by playing cards from your hand, each of which has a unique set of actions available on them, which you can play and combine in different ways, so things aren't quite as simple as they may seem. So, you'll need to develop a really good strategy during your turn because you can take up to 10 actions in a row, if you have a good plan. Over the course of the game, you'll encounter plenty of mysterious different ocean creatures and take them into your fold. And with their help, you'll explore the unknown locations of the depths and bring resources into your kingdom. Now mechanically, this is represented with the help of three layered player boards and the unique mechanism of card rising. And just what is card rising? I don't know, because that's where the, the description of the game left off. However, I am interested in finding out more about this game at Essen, particularly a description, perhaps even a demonstration, of what card rising is. And number 10 is Cities Skylines, the board game. This is a cooperative modular tile placement city building game by Cosmos. The City Skylines, the board game, is a cooperative game based on the popular computer game of the same name by Paradox Interactive. In this tabletop version, gameplay starts with a variety of land boards being visible, the specific number varying depending on the specific scenario that you're playing. 
But the goal, no matter how many tiles are shown, is the same, to finish a number of milestones and make the inhabitants of your city happy. Easy enough. <laughs> oh yeah, making people happy is a breeze. At the start of each milestone, one additional board is bought, flipped over from its nature side to its developed side, and then play continues. Players then have personal cards that show what they can build, and ideally, they discuss and plan with the other players how to best develop their city. To help players determine this, the cards show what effects the buildings will have on the city. For example, increasing the need for garbage collection, or decreasing crime, or giving a bonus if placed next to a park. And when the players do develop the city to the next milestone, well, then they choose which new board to buy to expand their city further, they score their current happiness, well, the game's happiness, not their own personal happiness, because that's, that's a whole other game in general, and then play continues until they reach their last milestone. And when that's finished, the game ends, and the total scores are accumulated, and players see how they did. A series of scenarios teach the game in steps, with each new step introducing new parts of the game. Each step is easily varied, such as, for example, switching out which unique buildings are used during that play session. So it's all of that seeming variability and potential player interactivity that really makes me interested to see how Cities Skylines actually plays out on the table, and one of the reasons why it's number 10 on my list of the games to check out at Essen. And with number 10, we end this particular installment. But join me again in just a few days as we continue on to the next batch of my top picks of games coming out at this year's Eschen Spiel Trade Fair. Until then, I have been Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise. Take care. Get ready to rock with this metal-inspired design of the Pair of Dice Paradise logo. Wear it around as you drive your 87 Trans Am to the next Dawkin concert. This thing is guaranteed to melt your face off, metaphorically.